we oftentimes want to think about, you know, the great genius, the Einstein or Elon Musk, the idea that this great genius comes up with the brilliant idea. But the idea is when you are working in that collaborative setting and you have people jointly trying to solve problems and bringing their intelligence, you're looking at exponential in increases in the amount of knowledge that is brought to bear on it. Hello, a hello, hello. Welcome to another Knowledge Bomb episode of Lead to Greatness, where we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential and together change the world. Today on Lead to Greatness, we have Thomas Macrony. And if this is your first time, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, hit the notification bell, so you won't miss any of these amazing episodes. And if you're on iTunes, go ahead and rate the podcast and leave a review. That helps get the word out to great leaders and entrepreneurs like yourself. Thomas is an international lawyer who combined his extensive and policy implementation experiences to device practical and systematic strategies that make multilateral treaties effective vehicles for change. Please help me welcome Thomas with Strategic Collaboration. This is Cedric Francis, and you're listening to the Lead to Greatness. I work as an international lawyer and a law professor, mm. and how countries can improve their legal systems to establish the rule of law and maintain the rule of law things that oftentimes we we take for granted in in the US been working in this field for uh, 28 years I've worked in the public sector private sector okay. NGOs uh, nonprofits uh, international organizations like the UN wow. um, and uh, currently I'm a law professor at Loyola University Chicago School of Law and work on a program there called the rule of law for development program but so i want you to kind of give us a little bit more detail on the uh international lawyer um you know what actually do you do and why is this role so important so international law traditionally pertains to the law between states between mm -hmm. sovereign countries in the world and how they interact between themselves things like human rights or the environment or the protections of workers. These all have dimensions that are international. There are also a lot of work that international lawyers do, say, advising their governments. What is the international law on X, Y, or Z relating to a particular issue that, that the country is facing? They advise on what possible or not possible to do under international law. And increasingly, international lawyers are uh, advising companies on mm -hmm. what they should do and what obligations they might have under international law or how developments in international law might affect business operations. Clear example, but we've also saw this in connection with the pandemic is how a disease starting in one part of the world ends up becoming a global problem and then bringing the whole global economy to its mm -hmm. knees very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Uh, um, we do need to find ways to cooperate and to collaborate on things internationally. And so I think for the average citizen, I think there needs to be a, a recognition and, and um, an appreciation for that aspect of how we address global problems and recognize that collaboration and cooperation with other countries is valuable. Uh, climate change, these are what we call global commons kinds of problems, yeah. meaning that they affect everybody in the world. And there's no one country that is uniquely affected. So the question in those kind of situations is, how do we collaborate? How do we find joint solutions? The climate affects everyone. And unless we collaborate jointly, um, we won't be able to solve those problems. So let's talk about poverty, for example, on a global scale. What are some of your hopes for that aspect? It's an important question. The sustainable development goals in the uh, United Nations are an effort to address global poverty as part of a broader package of economic development reforms that countries can undertake around the world. 
Okay. Um, one of the, the the issues with the SDGs, what as the Sustainable Development Goals are referred to, is yeah. that the targets and indicators that have been developed to measure progress uh, against the SDGs show that in many countries and at a global level, um, we are falling short. Mm. We're not achieving the targets that have been agreed to. And there are complex reasons for that. Certainly, uh, COVID-19 didn't help. There are two sides to the financing question. You need to have financing mobilized at the international level from wealthy countries to support countries that don't have as uh, many resources and enable them to make capital investments, to initiate programs, to spur economic growth but also to address the needs of poorest uh, citizens. But then there's a domestic level where even um, even very poor countries have a domestic tax system. And unfortunately, in many countries, the tax systems are ineffective or not effective enough. And so there's this simultaneous push to improve the flow of money from developed countries, mm -hmm. while also a lot of effort is being made to improve the revenue systems in developing countries to enable them to create tax systems can then fund poverty reduction and economic development activities. So it's the, the combination of those two things that I think are important now. Thank you for, for that insight. I want to talk about, you have this amazing book, Strategic Treaty Management. I want you to talk about this book and I want you to tell us the story uh, behind the book. The book is kind of a niche topic in international law, but it's become a much bigger topic since I've, I've written it. When we think about international law, mm -hmm. um, treaties are agreements that states sign to commit themselves to undertake certain activities or to avoid doing certain things. Um, and they become legally binding. Um, and so they're legal agreements, not dissimilar to a contract that set the baseline for a lot of activity. The problem that I saw from, from my work as, uh -huh. as, as a lawyer was the question of moving from an agreement to practice and to how do you take those static agreements and put them into practice. And what I started to see happening was that there was, among some treaty bodies, there was an approach to using strategic planning and taking ideas from the private sector and using those to help translate the aspirations in the treaties into practical action. And development was the idea of strategic planning and using strategic plans as a vehicle to improving the outcomes associated with treaties. And so there's a combination of activities, everything from financing to the use of science and data to measure the progress of the treaties, and then performance evaluation techniques that are crucial components to what I call strategic treaty management um, and have been used by a lot of different treaties, um, particularly in the environmental field, but not only. And so there's a question about whether this approach to strategic management, whether that can help move the dial in terms of improving the outcomes of these important treaties. Over the course of my professional career, I kept seeing more and more how collaboration was critical. Learning to work as part of a team and learning to uh, develop solutions with people. And sometimes, you know, if you're if you're all of the same mindset and you've got a project and everybody's executing on the project, that's maybe teamwork and that's that's not so that's not so hard where it gets challenging is where you're trying to make organizational decisions yeah. <laughs> and you have people with very different views and 
you know, sometimes we you know, read these these biographies of of business people like like Steve Jobs and think, oh, you know, he's a visionary. He had the idea and he went. But you know, what really I think uh, for in in most cases, what's really required is trying to to work and develop solutions jointly mm. in a team and learning to listen and and developing things uh, collaboratively. Yeah. And so if you were in a leadership role, you're in charge, but actually if you want to get anything done, you have to do it together. And I think we see in, in the news every year, you see examples of people thinking that they can just ram their approach <laughs> through on, on yeah. things. And it's just not effective. I, I wish somebody had explained that to me when I was in law school. It's important to try and, well, first of all, try and think from the other person's perspective, try and adopt that understanding. But one of the ways that I've seen getting people towards a, a shared understanding is to to focus on the ideas, focus on the ideas of what it is that you are trying to achieve and trying to use that, you know, taking it up a level mm. and using that as the basis for trying to drive some degree of, of consensus. And I think oftentimes we may, people are, we're humans, yeah. right? People get locked into a position one way or another and they think that's the only way they can go but when when you bring it up to uh, a higher level sometimes those those disagreements can can uh, dissolve and and people can get behind if we're in an organizational context get behind the, the mission of the organization and see that well okay maybe maybe this is an approach that 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 makes sense so within group of lawyers, you, you guys working together and trying to get something accomplished, what are some of the lessons over the years that you've learned that say, you know what, this works really well and, you know, it gets the ball going and it keeps things going smoothly and getting results quickly. What, what, what would some of those strategies be? I, I think that I've found most helpful is to really do your homework and okay. to really understand the issues that you're that you're working on and being able to share that with your your colleagues i think oftentimes appreciated that that can help to move people towards a, a joint solution to a collaborative uh, solution yeah. uh, sometimes if you are able to find insights that were not obvious to people previously talking to a lot of different people and and gaining insights from a lot of different people that can inspire people in ways that can unblock disagreements or motivate people to take an approach that maybe wasn't uh, initially recognized as 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 valuable yeah. that's that's the kind of method that I've seen and 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 have used in the past. Wow. Well, you know, and 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 there's an interesting there's an interesting aspect of this too. Is like from from the standpoint of our our individual intelligence. It's like we we oftentimes want to think about you know the great genius that Einstein or Elon Musk. The idea that this great genius comes up with the brilliant idea. But the idea is when you are working in a collaborative setting and you have people jointly trying to solve problems and bringing their intelligence, you're looking at exponential in increases in the amount of knowledge that is brought to bear on a particular problem, right? And so I think that that's really powerful. Um, we talk a lot about AI today, but you know, there's also a lot of intelligence that we humans sitting together and and sharing our 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 knowledge are able to obtain. Thomas, that is a knowledge bomb and lead to greatness. I don't want you to miss what Thomas is saying. He's saying something so brilliant. And Thomas, we really do this a lot of times. We look at somebody like. Elon Musk, and you see the ideas and things like that. All we can see is Elon Musk 
because yeah. he's the representative, but we miss the team, the team that's behind him. Elon Musk, you have Steve Jobs when, when you know, with Apple when he was alive, or Bill Gates, and you have even some of the people, Einstein of the past, and you yeah. have uh, uh, Thomas Edison, even somebody right now in this day and time like uh, John C. Maxwell, you know, one of the greatest leadership gurus of this day and time. They all have something in common, and that's that collaboration phase where they get the right people in the room. They get the best of the best, and oftentimes they're getting people that think and smarter than they are, and they take these ideas and they they create something great because they're the mastermind. They got the right people in the room to create the big idea, and they get the credit for the results because they were able to do that collaboration piece. And I don't want people to miss this. Collaboration is so, so, so important. And it can change the trajectory of your destiny. With this collaboration piece, take some idea with it. Could have been a, just an ordinary idea, but because everybody got in the room, it, it went from ordinary to extraordinary. Well, I've been I've, I've been involved in some strategy development processes. Okay. And, and in those processes, um, I've seen how um, one organization that I worked for just really had, had been around for a long time, but never had a strategic plan. Mm. And there was a decision to launch a strategic planning process. And when we started that process, there was a lack of uh, agreement on, well, should we even do a strategy? Uh, what is this <laughs> going to consist of? And uh, and all that. And as a result, again, it, it, what I mentioned, doing the homework, what we tried to do was to do as much uh, research and reflection and, and trying to understand what made organizations like us successful and what wow. were the ingredients and by doing that analysis and and reflection then individually but then also as a group and we did this over it was a really disciplined kind of process we met weekly over you know three or four months mm. um and you know, from starting from a really unclear, ambiguous, and lack of buy-in, there was a lot of skepticism. Oh, this is just going to be some document we put on. This. <laughs> it was so much. Yes, we we came up with good ideas, and 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 the ideas were important. But the the irony of the whole thing is that. The process was the most important part of it. And it was that process of jointly going through and strategizing and thinking about what we were as an organization compared to other organizations. Yeah. Um, and that made us realize what was our you know, particular comparative advantage versus others. And yeah. when we ultimately defined uh, more clearly how we were going to work and how we were going to go forward we were all we were firing on all cylinders and we were all unified and and the organization really was transformed as as a result of that process and uh, for me that was a very powerful uh experience did we achieve was it the the best strategy in the world and you know was it optimal for the organization i don't know yeah. but in terms of did it propel the organization in a direction to succeed? Absolutely. That's just a, a very practical illustration of how that collaboration really fulfilled the, the process. And I think you know, working uh, is it, tough, right? When we working in organizations, working for organizations, uh, the business world is is challenging. The nonprofit world is challenging. That we have all these stresses and difficulties um, as as professionals. But I think one of the things that makes work uh, rewarding today is the chance to be creative mm. and to bring creativity to Love it. Love it. your work and. 
a strategy process is is one illustration of of that uh, kind of opportunity. But I think when people are able to use their curiosity and get curious about what are we as an organization, what kind of business do we want to be, and engage in that kind of reflection, that starts to get fun. You know, and then when we're doing the day-to-day -day grind of, you know, sending this report and that report, it, it makes it more tolerable because yeah. you realize that there's this bigger picture, there's this bigger, you know, purpose behind what we're doing. And so finding ways to uh, use our curiosity and creativity, I think, are, are really uh, important. And, and we should we should take advantage of those opportunities knowledge bomb thomas thomas <laughs> thomas this was great this is great you know one of the takeaways I, I i got from the conversation was help better others and what they do so thank you thank you thank you uh for that information thank you for giving us something to think about to ponder on and something for us to um, you know just make changes and think about things that we have or the abundance of things we have here uh, versus someone else in need if someone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing where should they go Sure. I, well, I'm on LinkedIn, um, and uh, I also have a website, thomasfmcinerney.org, uh, um, and uh, I uh, have a newsletter on Substack called Treaty Bytes that looks at the um, intersection of technology and international law. Um, so for people interested in, in tech, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, in the uh, field of international law and, and international development that may be of interest I talk about. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, all your information is going to be in the show notes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Lead to Greatness community, we want to thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us all. Thank you for having me, Cedric. All right. It was a well, pleasure. Thank you for joining us today on the Lead to Greatness podcast. So remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace. Peace.